1971 to 77 Chevrolet Vega, a charming looking car, at least when it came out before the big bumper standards were enacted. And yet, despite its charming looks, the Vega certainly didn't charm many of its buyers. There were a number of reasons for this. One of them was rust. Vegas had some severe rust problems in a number of areas. But by and large, the major reason behind the Vega not endearing itself to the American buying public really was what was under hood. It's 2.3 liter four-cylinder engine, which was all new in the Vega. It's pretty unfortunate on many levels that the Vega engine just wasn't up to par under hood in these vehicles because if it had been a better design well gm may have succeeded in really getting new customers and acquiring them first-time buyers for example and walking them up the typical sloan ladder from a chevrolet to a pontiac to an oldsmobile to a buick etc instead the vega left a bad taste in many buyers mouths and quite a few of them just never bought a gm vehicle again but let's talk a little bit more about this novel engine that was under hood in the Chevrolet Vega and what some of the flaws were associated with it because, well, there were quite a few. First, some preliminaries. This 2.3 liter four cylinder, as I mentioned, was an all new design and an overhead cam design. The overhead cam here was driven by a belt similar to Pontiac's overhead cam six cylinder. By and large, there was nothing wrong with an overhead cam engine and even a belt-driven overhead cam engine. The belts on these proved to be relatively reliable even during the time period in which they were in service. And many vehicles went on to have belt-driven overhead cams. So this really wasn't the problem. Instead, let's begin a discussion about the challenges associated with this engine with the block itself because this is where quite a few of the problems began for the Vega engine. More specifically, the Vega engine was an aluminum block engine with a cast iron head. Yes, I said that right, aluminum block and cast iron heads. And we'll discuss the reasons for that decision, but it really was the block itself that created myriad problems for owners. Now, why is this, you might say? Aluminum blocks were not really novel during this time period. In fact, General Motors had introduced an aluminum V8 engine, a 215 cubic inch V8, in some of the senior compacts in 1961. It was the standard engine, in fact, in the Oldsmobile F85 and Buick Special and optional in the Pontiac Tempest. And other automakers had also produced aluminum engines, including Ford, who produced a massive 1,100 cubic inch overhead cam GAA V8 in World War II. So aluminum blocks were relatively well known. However, the big difference in the Vega engine is that this engine block did not have cylinder liners. And many of these previous aluminum engines that I just mentioned did have cylinder liners. In other words, you had the piston basically riding up and down in a liner that was made of cast iron or a great wear metal, if you will, as opposed to riding up and down in aluminum and right in the block itself like the Vega did. The first question is, why in the world would General Motors take this kind of approach? It seems very atypical, and indeed it was for the time period, although there were sleeveless aluminum engines at this time, certainly in things like chainsaws and weed whackers and lawnmowers. But this was one of the first applications in automotive history, at least, that this technique was used. While GM Research Labs had been working with Reynolds Aluminum at that time period, as well as Sealed Power, to develop an aluminum block that didn't need cylinder liners. The thought here was that a lot of cost could be saved because the cylinder liners cost about, well, $2 or roughly $15 to $20 in today's dollars to produce back at the time. And if you had a four-cylinder block, if you didn't have cylinder liners, that meant you could save about $8 or somewhere around $65 to $80 in today's terms per engine if you didn't need a cylinder liner. So certainly economy and cost was one motivation behind executing this type of design. However, beyond just the cost, GM and Reynolds thought that they actually could make this work. And they had been working on a particular aluminum alloy called A390 that was composed 77% of aluminum, 17% silicon, and 4% copper and various other elements to really form the basis of a block that pistons could ride up and down in this block 
And because of, in particular, the silicon content, it would wear relatively well. Or at least so the engineers thought. Unfortunately, one of the big problems with the Vega engine was cylinder scuffing, particularly in cold weather. And when you start the engine up in cold weather, it's not pressurized with oil. The engine has to be running for a brief bit before the oil begins to circulate around. And so the cylinders would end up scuffing the bores before oil could be properly circulated to them. And once the cylinders scuff the bores, well, you can imagine good things don't happen either for the bore wear or the piston ring wear, or even in some cases, the piston wear itself. More specifically, one of the things that GM engineers found out as they were working through challenges with the Vega was that typical aluminum pistons just wouldn't work in these engines. And as a consequence, they had to come up with an alternate type of piston that was dipped in an iron plating process. This iron plating process effectively enabled the pistons not to get scuffed and wear much better. Of course, once scuffing happens, then you would get what the Vega was well known for, and that was a high degree of oil burning and lots of blue smoke out the tailpipe. But in general, the engineers thought that they had fixed this issue before the Vega was released. Alas, they did not. Now let's return to a picture of the cylinder block for the Vega again, because there are a couple other issues associated with the block itself. We already talked about the fact that this engine doesn't have cylinder liners and engineers were trying to use an alloy of aluminum with a high degree of silicon and use the silicon as an anti-wear agent effectively for the piston to ride up and down the bore. But another issue associated with the block is really the design itself and these freestanding cylinders. Notice the look of the cylinders here that are located within the block and how they're basically just freestanding in the block itself. Take a look by comparison at a picture of a Chevrolet 350 engine block and notice what the cylinders look like here. They're clearly not freestanding. And as a consequence, there is much more rigidity associated with this block, irrespective of the material that the cylinder block is made of. Now the challenge with the freestanding cylinders in the Chevrolet Vegas engine block is that with each cycle of the pistons up and down, they kind of want to wiggle that area that they're riding up and down in back and forth and left and right. And as a consequence, the cylinders are moving a little bit as opposed to in the Chevrolet 350 block that you saw where they're clearly not going anywhere. And then that can create various gasketing issues, particularly with head gaskets. And that was another one of the issues that the Vega had in some cases and also was typical of some aluminum block engines from GM during the time that had this freestanding cylinder wall design. Yet another issue associated with the Vega engine was something external to the engine itself. And that is, let's take a look at this engine compartment photo here. Where's the radiator? Can you find it? It's there. It is just amazingly small. It's about a foot by a foot. One foot by one foot is all the radiator capacity that the Chevrolet Vega engines generally had. And originally there were some reports that GM was trying to develop this engine and really not even have a radiator. The thought was that the aluminum could reject heat quickly enough that the car just didn't need one. Well, durability testing obviously proved that not to be the case. And so the Vega ended up coming with this extremely puny one foot by one foot radiator. And you can imagine how much or how little coolant that radiator was able to hold. Now, interestingly, this perhaps might not have been an issue and something that the engineers would have picked up on. But one of the key elements of GM's test procedures for validation during this time period was that all engineers who were testing the vehicles had to first check the fluid levels in the vehicle before proceeding with the test. Now, this doesn't seem like it's a large issue, but one of the things that most consumers don't do is, well, check their fluid levels before they start off. And when you only have a radiator that holds one foot by one foot cooling capacity and you start losing 
a little bit of coolant, which tends to be the case, particularly with these engines. Before long, you don't have much coolant in the radiator and you're not circulating as much coolant as you otherwise thought you would, leading to the chance that the engine may overheat. Now, once the engine overheats, you can imagine what happens. Well, cylinder scuffing occurs, and we already talked about what happens with cylinder scuffing. The engines start burning quite a bit of oil, and they're effectively toast at that point. There's nothing you can do. You can't rebuild these engines without cylinder liners. There really wasn't a way to remachine them on a cost-effective basis and put oversized pistons in, as an example. It made sense just to replace the engine block entirely. So wasn't a great design to have this relatively small radiator that customers wouldn't generally check the fluid levels in. And as a consequence, after a while, GM ended up putting in a coolant level light in the Vega to alert drivers when the coolant level was not where it should be. GM also ended up adding a coolant recovery bottle to the Vega in an attempt to help provide an overflow area for coolant as well as a place where the radiator could pick up excess coolant in the event that it was low. There was another issue associated with the radiator and that was its placement. More specifically, the placement of the radiator was below the level where coolant would circulate in the head of the engine, which is not an optimal design from a heat transfer perspective. So that also contributed to potential overheating and further stress on the cooling system. Yet another issue with respect to the design of the engine were the valve stem seals on the early Vega engines. More specifically, they just would tend to disintegrate and then that would lead to oil consumption. So in some cases, an owner thought that the engine was consuming oil because of cylinder scuffing or cylinder wear, and it was really just due to the valve stem seals in some of these engines. So overall, these are just a few of the issues associated with the engine in the Chevrolet Vega. And I think the unfortunate part was really how long it took GM to respond to a number of these issues. For example, it took until 1972 for GM to add a coolant recovery bottle to some of the Vegas. And in that case, it only came on vehicles equipped with the two-barrel four-cylinder engine, the optional engine, and air conditioning. In 1973, that coolant recovery bottle, as well as the previously mentioned coolant level warning light, would be made standard across the entire lineup, which one could argue really should have happened from day one. And then, unfortunately, it took GM until the 1976 model year to really make a number of substantial improvements to the engine from new valve stem seals to improved cooling passages and Chevrolet tried to rebrand the engine at that point, the Durabilt engine, as you can see in this ad here, and gave it a 60,000 mile warranty, which was better than any competitive warranty by far. But it was really too little too late. It was also in this year that GM finally installed plastic fender liners in the Vega after finding that they had to replace many under warranty due to rust and corrosion issues. So it just took GM a long time to respond to a number of these issues as they crept up. And I think that also contributed to the car's unfortunate reputation. And I will say, based on what I just related, if you have to own a Vega, you're just craving one, I would highly recommend you get one from 1976 or 1977 because of the changes that were made. Despite the fact the car doesn't look quite as good because you have the big bumpers then by that point. It also likely didn't help that once a customer bought a Vega, they perhaps became irked by some serviceability issues. One example of which is the air cleaner assembly on these Vegas. It was designed literally as an assembly and you could not replace the paper element inside of the air cleaner. You had to buy an entirely new air cleaner assembly, which of course was quite costly. This seems blasphemous, but it's absolutely true. And imagine you had just bought this relatively cheap car. You probably don't have all that much disposable income. And here you are just trying to replace your air filter and you can't do it. You end up having to replace the entire air cleaner assembly uh, as a result. Well, that's not ideal and probably proved annoying to some customers. And there you have it, the story of the engine inside the little Chevy Vega. It's unfortunate that it had so many issues because...
the car, as you can see here, really was a good looker. And it did have a number of things going for it. It was also a good handling car, but the engine issues really did it in and I think turned a lot of buyers off from GM for many years, if not their lifetime. Thanks again for watching this video. Until next time, take care.